Welcome to West Meadows. We're so glad that you have chosen to join us today, whether you are on site or online, because we believe that God wants to do amazing things in your life and in the lives of those all around you. So let's worship Him together. Sing to the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you gotta stand down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you gotta shout from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that it's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder, wait for the answer. Worship with your hands in the air. I praise you anywhere. Praise, give and praise, give and praise in the highest praise. Give and praise, give and praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, He is worthy of all of the praise. Sometimes you gotta praise in the praise. Sometimes you gotta stand on the shackles, brave in the battle, worship with your hands held high. I praise you anywhere, praise, give me praise, give me praise in the highest praise, give me praise, give me praise in the highest. praise and we praise him anywhere and anytime and today as a community we praise him here today good morning and welcome we're so glad you can join us today you know there's so many reasons that we praise the lord and sings worship for him and one of those things is that he saved us from sin from death by what he has done on the cross so as this first sunday is communion may we remember what he has done on the cross and how his love saved us from death and sin Sing it out. There's a place of mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place of streams of grace flow deep and Like a flood, a 
Joseph, when he was with Isaac, and now he's still holy, and he is with us, and his holiness is the only reason that we're able to appreciate and experience his everlasting love, and the sacrifice of what Jesus has done on the cross, you know what the good news is, it says here in Romans 3, uh, 38 to 39, it says here, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So nothing in this world, the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ as your own Savior, the moment you accepted his love, nothing can take you away from him. So let's sing this song and just take it in how much our God loves us.
Please be seated. Our God is a Father who we can approach in that same way we would approach our Father here on earth, with adoration, with love in our eyes, and he's there to welcome us with open arms. May we approach him now in prayer. Please join me. God, we pause in your presence. We set aside everything that is clouding our minds. And we just sit before you. God, we know that as we just sit and we just pause, that your love is still pouring out onto us. And we praise you for that. A God whose love never changes, but knows no end. We thank you for sending your son. We thank you for the great sacrifice that that was, yet you were willing to pay it for a relationship with your children. God, may we approach you daily as your child with adoration, with praise in our eyes and in our hearts because of the goodness of our holy, holy Father. God, we know we are flawed people. We know that we all have pasts, so God, we want to also recognize that, that there have been hurts in the past that go beyond us. And only you can heal those. And God, as we walked out of the Truth and Reconciliation Day yesterday, may we continue to hold that in our hearts. But may we also seek reconciliation in every other relationship in our lives. For God, you call us to that. Every time we approach the table, you call us to reconcile with all those that we've hurt. So today as we do that, may you bring those names to our hearts. And may we truly seek that out. And God, we also repent of all the times where we have fallen short of your glory, where we have put our ways above your ways, May we be a people who seek your ways more and more in every situation so that our way gets pushed aside so that only you are what others see through us. God, we continue to ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit so that in those moments when we feel weak, your strength can carry us. Your comfort can support us. Your healing hand can be upon us. God, we ask that you bless us in such a way that we are able to yield all that we are to you. Whatever we have, whether it be our time, may we give that freely as we serve others. Whether we are blessed with financial gain, may we just pour that out on others so that they can see you in their time of need. May in every instance where we yield to you, may you be the driving force behind every action that we do. Not for personal glory, but for the glory of the God, the Father that we can sit at his feet and just say, praise you, God. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to continue our time of worship here today. We've sung praises to God. We've prayed to our Holy Father, but we also want to continue through the act of giving. And so if you're with us online, feel free to click the button just above me. All of our available giving options are there. If you're here in house, we encourage you to take advantage of the boxes at the back on your way out. 
All of that giving goes towards the ministry here at West Meadows, whether that be a men's breakfast, which I won't steal Zach's punchline, but there may be an edit to his announcement that he said last week, um, or whether that's the cafe ministry that we have out in the foyer, we encourage you to take advantage of that. If you're new with us here, grab a coffee and chat with one of us. If you're brand new here and this is your first week, we encourage you to take advantage of our welcome desk as well, where we have a gift for you and we just want to get to know you a little bit better in that way. And we also want to share a story of some new life around here, which is not another baby dedication, all right? All right? That's not going to happen today, but there will be one in the future if, you know, more babies are coming. But we have pickleball here now, and so we actually had a huge amount of people in our foyer this week, and I was the line judge, and Mark said, well, maybe Thursday afternoons isn't, you know, that's not what you don't want to do with your whole afternoon, but I was the line judge this Thursday, and so I was able to call Brenda Graves short on a bunch of serves, so it was really, really fun. And so if you don't know who Brenda is, pickleball is a great time to come and meet her. Um, and so we encourage you to take advantage of pickleball on Thursday afternoons or any other ministry we have here at West Meadows. And so we want to show you a few more of those right now. Welcome to West Meadows. Coming up this week, Real Life Discipleship will begin on Tuesday evening. This is a course designed to help you guide others towards a deeper relationship with Jesus. It will teach you valuable tools on how to be a disciple that makes disciples. Also coming up on Tuesday is our Hour of Prayer at 7 p.m. Whether you need prayer for something going on in your own life or you want to be part of praying for others, everyone is welcome. That's this Tuesday at 7 p.m. here at the church. All men are invited to our men's breakfast this Saturday at 9 a.m. Remember last week when I said the cost is $20? Sorry, that was wrong. The cost is $10. Look at that, that's half off. You'll be in for some quality teaching, good chats, and great food. We'd like to invite you to a congregational meeting after church on Sunday, October 15th. We'll address the financials from our last fiscal year and affirm new nomination committee members, which you can read more about in the agenda at the welcome desk in the foyer. This meeting will be very short, but very important, so please plan to attend. Lastly, if you're looking for an opportunity to get to know other people in the church, we've got a bunch of Connect Group events coming up in the next two weeks. There's something for young families, Gen X, seniors, and young adults, just to name a few. These are all great opportunities to connect and build relationships with others in the church. If you'd like to learn more about Real Life Discipleship, the Hour of Prayer, the Men's Breakfast, the Congregational Meeting, or our Connect Groups, stop by the Next Steps area in the foyer after service or go to westmeadows.org slash next steps. We're here to help you explore what's next for you. For now, let's hear this week's message. Well, good morning. Welcome to everybody who's on site with us and those who are joining us online again through West Meadows at Home. Uh, welcome to October. This year going fast enough for you? Just, that happens every year, doesn't it? Just flies by. I've said every year. Just flies by. I can't believe next weekend is Thanksgiving already. Uh, and then did you know that that means that we are about 75 days away from Christmas? Yeah, okay, there's always a mi- I threw it out there because there's a mixture. <laughs> Some people are like, oh my gosh, that's, that's not enough time. And then there's Trevor, he's been watching uh, Christmas movies for a few months already. <laughs> Loving Christmas, yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, yes, the, things are moving on, and this is week four of our series, which we're moving through very quickly as well, where we're looking at uh, kind of a model of how Jesus blessed people that we can apply to our own lives, as we have an opportunity to bless people and take these simple steps of, of loving others by showing God's love to others through these simple steps. And, and for followers of Jesus then, back, back when he was first you know, walking and ministering, uh, right up to now, we can look at Jesus' teaching, we, we can look at his life, and we see that as he lived, it was different than how other people in the world live. It's, he he kind of brought what we can refer to as this paradigm shift on how we interact with people. Now, this, this idea, this word, this phrase of a paradigm shift speaks to a, a fundamental change in the way that we understand or experience something. A, a fundamental change on how we view something, whether it be the world or people or how we interact within that world. And, you know, every generation has these paradigm shifts, these things that change how we view things. So one I thought of, for example, you know, predate, predates me, but they're because you know, I grew up in a home where we always had a TV in the home. But there are some people here, I know it would be a smaller number, but there are some people here who remember that, that, 
that day when things changed, when, when dad brought home the very first television. And it was just a, a box that had a picture on it, but it completely changed the way that you viewed entertainment. It changed the way that you viewed and had access to the world. And a lot of things changed by the entrance of this one thing. You know, for example, up until that point, when the first TVs came into people's homes, up to that point, every Canadian home had to gather around a radio to listen to Hockey Night in Canada. Now, Hockey Night in Canada started broadcasting on the radio in 1931, where they, they, they broadcast for the very first time the, the Leafs and the Blackhawks playing the home opener in what was then the new Maple Leaf Garden. And, of course, the, the Leafs lost to the Hawks 2-1, to one, if you're curious. But then in 1952, they broadcast the very first televised Hockey Night in Canada. Now, now for hockey fans, or for those who kind of understand what I'm saying here, that's a radically different experience, isn't it? To go from listening to hockey on the radio to Hockey Night in Canada now on a television. Those, those, that sport that so many Canadians love, the, the players we love to hear about, I can see them as they skate now. And it's this radical shift of everything. Well... Not everything, because the very first Hockey Night in Canada game, the Leafs played the Blackhawks again. And then guess what happened? Six to two. They lost again. So, see, some things never change. The, the Leafs just continue to lose. But, but you get the idea, for, you know, from radio to TV, this paradigm shift. Now, now I'm, I'm a bit younger to understand that shift, for example. But in the 50 years that I've been around, I've seen a lot of big changes as well. Many of you will be able to understand how things changed when we started to have this device called a microwave in our house. And that changed the whole meal planning, meal prep, how we, how we gather for meals. I remember the very first time that I saw a Nintendo Entertainment System. Now you might think that's just a toy, but it changed things. It changed the way that I played with my friends. We stopped going outside as much, and now we're inside all the time. We, we stopped using our imaginations as much, and now we're looking at a screen. It paradigm shift. Through this one thing. I remember the very first email I sent. I remember being trained how to send emails. And it changed the way that I send quotes and communicate with my customers. And now, you know, fast forward to today. We all are very aware of how artificial intelligence is touching every field of business and life. These paradigm shifts happen throughout our lives. And, and for some of you, this sermon series is, is a paradigm shift for how you view evangelism. Some of you so much so that you didn't even know this was a, serv- this was a series on evangelism. <laughs> You're just hearing, if, really, this is, this is how we do evangelism? Yes, because in the past, in the past when you would hear that word, it would be intimidating. And you'd think about handing out tracts to, to strangers on the street corner or accosting them in some way that made them scared or offended. And you'd be like, I'm not doing this. I, and I feel guilty not doing it, but I'm going to leave it to the experts. But as we go through this series, now we're starting to think a bit differently. You know, evangelism maybe isn't as hard or as scary as I thought it was. I can just begin by starting with prayer. And then after I pray, I can, I can go out and, and as I meet people, I, I, I can listen to people. As I listen to their stories and hear their hearts and we build a friendship, I can go to the next step and I can, I can maybe invite them to share a meal or to have a cup of coffee with me. And all of a sudden, we see this shift of how we view Sharing God's love of how we view what we would call evangelism. We find that rather simple, straightforward, natural ways of doing this. And so to this model, today we want to move to our fourth step of revealing God's love to others. And it is the first S, which stands for serve. And we are again going to see in Jesus how he modeled a completely different way of viewing this. A completely different way of understanding how he and his followers can view and can serve. And we'll see a shift in paradigm for them, and maybe even for us today too, as we go through it. Now the account that I want to look at today is is found in John chapter 13. I invite you to turn there in your Bibles if you have them. If you want to use a pew Bible, it's on page 874. Or of course, we've got the pew portal, that code right in front of you that you can scan. And it'll take you right to the sermon notes. And this passage takes place on the night that Jesus is sharing his last meal with his disciples. And Jesus knew that the time had come. And he was moments away from being betrayed by Judas, from being arrested, from being crucified, and from raising and returning to the Father. And as he gathers in this upper room with his followers, he loves them. He loves these guys. But he also, he knows that they... 
they don't understand that his sacrifice, the sacrifice he's been telling them about for the past few weeks, is he knows that they don't understand that this sacrifice is the best way that he can serve all of humanity. You see, Jesus knew the mission for which he came, and, and, and he knew that if he was going to give his life and return to the Father, and the mission was going to continue, that his followers needed to understand why he was doing what he was doing as well. And so wanting to express this, but also wanting to explain it, we read this in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, in light of his awareness of these things, he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, he wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that, he, he took a water basin and put water in it, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus had told his disciples in, in the past, previously in this ministry, he, he had told them, guys, I've I've not come to be served. I have come to serve. And I'm not 100% sure what those guys thought of when he said that. But, but I think we can assume that when the disciples heard Jesus say that I didn't come to be served but to serve, they thought, well, he's just being humble. He's, he's, you know, he's, trying, to, he's trying to minimize. He's trying to be humble. You know, of, of course he's going to be served, but like just a little like, like, serve less than another person would be served, right? That's, that's what he's talking about. After all, he is, he is King Jesus. No one will question if people served King Jesus. That's how the world works, isn't it? There's, there's people who are lower who serve those who are over them. So nobody would be surprised or questioned if Jesus was served by people. So he, he must not mean no service at all. He, he must mean just, just less than we would expect. But then this night comes around, and no one had ever seen a king wash anyone's feet, yet alone his followers. This was a shocking gesture. You see, foot washing, some of us will be familiar with this concept of foot washing, but it was routine. It was a routine activity that you would do before you had a meal. Because they didn't sit around tables and chairs like we do and just kind of, you know, sit there and eat with our feet on the floor and our, you know, elbows off the table, right? Mom says keep elbows off the table. They didn't sit around tables like that. They reclined. And so when you're reclining, you might be kind of laying on your, your left hip and your elbow with your, your feet kicked off to the side a little bit. And then there's somebody beside you. That means that your feet could very well be in that next person's space and face. And keep in mind, this was a time where they had no nail clippers. They, there was no place to go get a pedicure. There were no socks and shoes. You, you wore sandals or you wear bare feet and you walked everywhere. You know what else they didn't have? They didn't have bylaws about picking up after your dog. They didn't have bylaws about picking up after your sheep. They didn't have very many sanitation standards in place that were always following. So, so you were constantly, let's just say, stepping in it. And then you go to a meal and you'd recline and you'd kick your feet off to the side. Foot washing was gross. It was a gross job. It was, it was a, something that was reserved for the lowest servant in the home to do. And as the disciples come into the upper room that night, and as they recline at the table, there is no servant present. So they thought. Uh, there is no one there to wash their feet, and they, they knew that, and yet they reclined at the table. And, and, and none of them are about to offer to do this either. Did you notice that? Nobody offered to do this. No, no one offered to say, hey, hey guys. I notice that no one's here to wash our feet, but don't worry about it. Sit tight. I got it. None of them. We can't blame them. Would you? Would you, anybody? Would anybody have volunteered to wash all twenty-four dirty, gross, stinky feet before you ate? It, it maybe if their moms were there. If their moms were there, now boys, you go wash your feet before dinner, and then everyone would have gone and done that. But but even then, they only would have washed their own feet. They wouldn't have washed anybody else's feet. When mom tells the kids to go wash their hands before dinner, how many of them wash their brothers or sisters' hands? No, they, they look after themselves, right? And then they rush back out. We don't wash anybody else's hands or feet. Besides, a few days earlier, if you flip back a few pages, if, a few days earlier, these guys were arguing over who was going to rank the highest in the kingdom of God. And now here they are, and they're not about to wash somebody else's feet and prove that they're of a lower status. 
That would completely fly in the face of the argument that they were making days earlier. But Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew who they and the masses thought he was. And he was aware of a need to change this paradigm that they held about what it means to serve. And so Jesus Christ, God in flesh, the author, the creator, the sustainer of all that ever has been, the Lord of lords and the king of kings, gets up from the table, walks over to the corner, strips down to a loincloth, ties a towel around his waist. He picks up a bowl and some water and pours the water into it. And then he exchanges his crown for an apron. And he comes and kneels before each of his followers. He washes their feet. Silence would have come over that room in that moment. The only sound you would have heard in that room were gasps that he was doing this. And the gentle splashing of water against their feet. And then Peter breaks the silence and says what everybody in the room is thinking. And he says this in verse 6. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing now, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. I'm not sure how to contemporize this for us. The significance of what's happening. I, 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 I don't know. Like, like, ima- imagine, I guess, I, I don't know. I, I imagine you're a Swifty. I don't know. You know what a Swifty is? A Taylor Swift fan. Like a fanatic. Right? Uh, imagine you're a Swift. Some of us have to imagine harder than others. Right? I have to imagine really hard. But she comes over to your house, and before you serve the spaghetti, she excuses herself and she walks into your bathroom and starts scrubbing your toilet. You're going to have a mixture of feelings in this moment that that happens. You're going to be thinking, oh my gosh, Taylor Swift is scrubbing my toilet. Quickly followed by, oh my gosh, Taylor Swift is scrubbing my toilet. But I know this for a fact. None of us would be okay with this. Every one of us would try to stop or Every single one of us would say, no, no one should ever have to do that, especially you. And that is just, that's just a taste of how that would have felt. Like, but, but a thousand times over is what Peter is feeling in this moment. How does Jesus respond? So we finish verse 8. Jesus answered him. He said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well, well then, Lord, Peter said, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. See, Peter didn't realize, as Jesus said, he didn't realize what Jesus was doing in that moment. But really, how could he? How could, how could any of us at that moment, in that situation, at that point, fully understand? That's why Jesus says, you don't understand now, but, but soon you will. Because in just a few hours, Jesus would be stripped again. And he would again set that crown aside, not for an apron this time, but for a cross. Where he would take upon the full weight of our filth. He would take upon the full weight of our sin, and he would wash us. He would wash all of us once for all with his grace. And in that moment, we would be totally, forever, from head to toe, from inside to out, cleansed of all of that filth that comes from our sin. And we'd have an opportunity to return to right relationship with God. You see, this was not just a kind gesture of foot washing that Jesus was doing. This was signifying a paradigm shift on what it means to serve, of what it looks like to be in service to others. And to further explain this, Jesus then concludes this part of the story in verse 12 by saying this to his followers. It says that when he had finished washing their feet, he put his clothes back on and returned to his place at the table. And he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? Bit of a rhetorical question. Because they fully didn't. But they were eager to understand now. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. 
And rightfully so, for, for that is what I am. But now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Because very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. No is a master greater than the one who sent him. But now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Essentially, he says to all who gather around that table there, and all who would come to walk in his footsteps right up to this very day. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn to serve in the way that Jesus has served you. See, a paradigm not based upon how the world understands things. Because how does the world understand these things? Very similar to how the disciples do. They, the world understands this idea of power differently than how Jesus demonstrated it. You see, people in the world tend to seek and celebrate power through, through wealth and success, which all gets wrapped up in status. And it leads to this worldview quite often that if you want to be blessed, you've got to look out for number one. And sure, people below you can be blessed too, but, but number one. Look out for number one. But to them, to, to anybody who holds a worldview of that sense, Jesus is, is kind of saying here, stop polishing your crown and lay it down. Stop polishing your crown and lay it down and put on an apron. You are not too great to serve, and serving does not make you great. But you want to know what it looks like to be blessed, to bless others? Do as I have done. Do you, do you see as we come to the end of this of this story, do you, do you see how Jesus' explanation and how his command to his followers was a paradigm shift from the world? Do we see that? Do, do we understand how, how if we follow in those footsteps of Jesus, that, that if we were to do that, how powerful a demonstration of God's love can be revealed for that. Did, are you with me? You with me? I can go over it again. No? <laughs> are you with me? Fantastic. Because I want us to keep that in mind. I want to keep it in mind because I want to look at one more story really quickly with these things in mind to help us understand how we can take this idea that none of us are too great to serve and serving does not make any of us great. How we can take that in the days that lay ahead of us into our world in which we live. I want to look at another story. This one's found in Mark chapter 7. So if you've got your Bibles open, the few Bibles, you can flip to page 819 in there. And here we see an encounter that Jesus had with another man, a, a deaf man, near the Sea of Galilee. And I'm going to read the whole story. It's only a couple of verses. I'm going to read the whole story, then we're going to circle back, and we're going to look at three lessons for how we can reveal God's love through serving others as we walk out the doors into this world in a short time. So we see this in Mark chapter 7. Start in verse 31. Obviously, this is earlier in Jesus' ministry. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went on through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There, some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hands upon him. So after Jesus took the man aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears, and he, and he spit and he touched the man's tongue. And he looked up to heaven, and with a deep sigh, he said, Ephapheth, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. And Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept on talking about it. And people were overwhelmed with amazement. As we consider this story, the first lesson that we see on how we can serve in the world around us is this, is proximity. There are people right in front of you that you have the opportunity to serve. Now, yes, there are some people who are sent to other places. There are people that we call missionaries who are sent to different lands, different regions, different purposes. But, uh, and we want to pray and we want to serve them through prayer and through support and through encouragement. Absolutely. But that is an exception to where most of us are going to find this opportunity. Most of us will find the opportunity to serve right within the proximity around us. Right around us. What was Jesus doing in this story 
when he found this opportunity to heal this man. He was just going about his day. He was going about his mission, and people brought to him this man to be healed. You see, we don't have to travel far and wide to find opportunities to serve people in love in the name of Jesus Christ. They exist every day in small ways. I was thinking about this, about how perhaps in the past little while I've served my neighbors, like the people who live to the left and to the right of me. And I thought, you know, there, there's small things that I do. I, 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 I cut their grass for them, their front yards. I don't go in the backyards, but I, I cut their, their front yards for them when, when I do mine. Well, I got one neighbor, his bins always blow over. His garbage bins are always blowing over. I, I make sure I pick up, not just pick up the bins, but if garbage spills, I, I, I put the garbage back in the bin. We, we serve each other by shoveling each other's sidewalks. I've, I've got a neighbor on one side, his, his downspout was a little, little broken, a little off to the side. It wasn't catching the water properly, so I, I just fixed it. I just, I just fixed his downspout. I got a, number, a neighbor on this side who, who grows weeds, so I, I serve him by secretly killing his weeds for him. <laughs> so, He's like, I don't ever get any weeds. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, I don't know either. It's crazy. I, but I serve, no, I serve myself a bit in that one. But, but, but I serve them through these ways. In our church, people serve constantly within our church. We've seen the incredible change of phase one of the landscaping update out front. There were people who were serving for hours to make that possible. The, the more unified back of the sanctuary that we have, it was so many people serving, using their skills to serve the church through the renovations, increased in ministry. We need more people to serve as greeters and ushers as more people tend to join us on site. <clears throat> we, have, we have growing youth ministries and food bank needs to the point where we, we're trying to talk about how can we find drivers to help people get around. I mean, maybe we even need somebody to serve us by giving us a van. Like, like There's all these opportunities all around you, in your neighborhood and in your church. See, as you go about your life, you will find people you work with every day you have an opportunity to serve. To begin by prayer, listen to them, maybe share lunch with them. You'll find opportunities to serve them. There's people you see every day when you drop the kids off at school, when you attend a meeting, when you go shopping. There's opportunities all around us. If we'll see it, we don't need to go to far distant places. It's right in front of us. Start with the people you encounter where you live, work, and play. God will send you people that you can serve. And when you identify, when that happens, we can go to our second thing, which we see from the stories that we serve personally. What do I mean by personally? Serving people in the name of Jesus is not meant to be a spectator sport. Let me clarify what I mean. What did Jesus do when they brought this man to him? It says, it says in verse 33, he took the man aside, away from the crowds. Verse 36, he says, don't tell anybody. I want you to tell anybody this has happened. Why? Well, I think, I think for two reasons. One, I think he took the man aside because this, this man had a disability. He had probably spent a lot of his life having people point out, hey, <laughs> you have a disability. You have a challenge in your life. It's very, very visual, very obvious to a lot of people, don't you? Well, let's all gather around while you're healed from it. But Jesus took the guy aside because he didn't need spectators. He didn't need to make this man a further spectacle in the midst of the healing. But also, Jesus told him not to tell anybody. Not because he was embarrassed or ashamed by it. He, he was not doing it for the fame. He was not doing it for the applause that he may receive from doing such an amazing, miraculous act. He was healing the guy because he cared about him. He didn't need an audience to do that. You see, that doesn't mean that service has to always be in private. It doesn't mean we have to serve in private. But it does mean that we need to check our motives before we serve, and that we do not serve for the applause or for the fanfare that we might gain from it. Jesus said earlier when he gave his command, he says, no messenger is greater than the one who sent him. No servant is greater than his master. You see, sometimes we think about, well, okay, I have to humble myself. You know, you know I'm, I'm here and there's people down here. I'll humble myself to serve them. Jesus is like, no, that's, you know, through his example, that wasn't what his message was. We have to get rid of that idea. But he also was saying, if you're down here and you serve people, serving, that doesn't make you great either. We, we don't do it to be made great either. We do it because it's right. We do it because it was done for us first. We don't need an audience. We don't need fanfare. We don't need to receive that applause. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for this. 
He rebuked the Pharisees and he told them, he says, they, they put their prayers and their displays and their giving on public display and people see it and people, people look up to them for it. And he says, they've received their reward in full. Every reward they're going to get, they've already received. But we can lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven by serving people with the right heart and the right attitude, by not making it public. It, it doesn't mean there can't be people around it. It's about the motive. You understand what I'm saying? It's about the motivation behind it. And so the question really comes down to when we're serving other people, are we doing it for our own glory or are we doing it to restore help, to restore dignity, and to give glory to God is the question behind serving personally. So there's people within our proximity. There's people we can serve personally. And then the third thing we see from the story that we can apply to our lives is we serve powerfully. Because when we serve, we are accessing and expressing the power of God. Where do we see that in the story of Jesus? We see this not just in this story, but in other ones. When Jesus heals somebody, he tends to look upwards. He, he tends to say a few words. He, and we see this in examples. For example, when he feeds the 5,000. When, when he raises Lazarus from the dead. When, when he gives his life upon the cross. And in this story, we see that he tended to look upwards. And he, he tended to say a few words. Now, we do not want to understand from this that there is power in the words. We don't want to understand from this that there's a magical formula of a little dance that we do that, that, that gets us access to God's power. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean we memorize or repeat exactly the way that it was done there. What we see from that example is that Jesus is trying to draw the attention. Attention, the focus of, draw his own heart, to, to draw the people who may be around him, to, to draw the attention of those he is healing towards his heavenly Father. See, this it is this power of the Father through me through which you are healed. It is the power of God through me through which you are served. And it's important to note that whenever Jesus served somebody, he was accessing the power of God flowing through him. And when you and I serve somebody else in the name of Jesus, whether it's, it's babysitting for a single mom or, or shoveling someone's driveway or helping them to move or offering an encouraging word or folding and putting away laundry... Whatever that service thing is, it's important for us to understand that we too have access to the power of God. And when God is brought into it, when the power of God is brought into even what we think is the most mundane chore, the very presence of God's power gives it opportunity to become a transformational moment. It's not, it's not our presence that can transform a life or a moment. It's the power of God. And we need to understand that we bring this with us as followers of Christ when we serve and I didn't just make this up. Jesus himself said this in John 14, 12. He says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Not because we are great, but because of the great power of God flowing through us in these moments. It has transformational power. Do we believe this? Do we? Because when you serve by, by praying for somebody who is sick, by, by, by helping a person who is downcast, by, by offering an encouraging word or a presence in somebody who is in a relationship that seems hopeless, do not be afraid to ask God to move powerfully. Do not be afraid to ask God to move. Do not be afraid to ask him to heal. Do not be afraid to ask him to restore and to redeem a life because that's the business that he is still in. And in this way, we are accepting Jesus' invitation and his command to bless others through proximity, through doing it personally, and doing it powerfully. Amen? Amen. Well, I want to just close. I just want to close this message today by looking at what this can look like. Sharing a story with you of what this can look like in the world in which we're about to go in a few minutes in revealing God's love. It's a story about a guy named Adam who worked in a retail store. Now, not his dream job, but he needed a job. And so he, he took this job, and he said, you know what, I'm, wherever God plants me, I'm going to try, try and just flourish. And so I'm going I'm to pray that God would use me in the midst of this place. And, and, and he began each day of work w with praying that he would get to know people, and he did. He got to know his coworkers, a couple of customers too, but, but mainly his coworkers by listening to them and hearing their stories. And he became really good friends with a guy named Jeremy. Now, over time, Jeremy was willing to have conversations with Adam about what he called religion. We'll discuss religion. And he was trying to make it clear to Adam that I am not a Christ follower. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in Jesus, but we'll talk about religion. 
spiritual things, if you like. You probably know people in your own life who, who have a distinction. They, they'll talk about some of these things, but they won't talk about specifically Jesus. And so they would have these conversations, and they would share life. And, and sometimes they would share lunch breaks together at the food court. And this one particular day, as they're having lunch together in the food court, they, they were talking about all sorts of stuff, but, but Jeremy seemed to be rather, rather down this particular day. And, and he got kind of worried. He said, is there, is there something wrong? And Jeremy said, yeah, my, you know, my, my son broke out in these really, really bad hives. We took him to the doctor, but the doctor says they, they can't do anything. They've given him kind of what they can, a little ointment, but it doesn't seem to be touching it at all. And, and he can't go to school, and he's, he's home alone, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm really worried about him. And so Adam said, well, do, do you mind if I, if I pray for God to heal him? I'll ask you know, for God to heal him. And without a pause, Jeremy said, yes, please, please do. Now, as they went back to work, the, the, the store was rather busy, so Adam snuck into kind of the, the back storeroom where he's by himself, and he just prayed a simple prayer. You know, God, I know you love Jeremy, and, and I love Jeremy. And you know that he's hurting, and, and God, I don't know what I can do except pray and, and support him, encourage him, and I do so through prayer. And so, God, I ask, could you heal his son? And he walks out back to the floor, and moments later, Jeremy comes running across the room and says, Adam, that prayer thing really works. He says, your God must be real, because my son just texted me, and he says, Dad, you won't believe it, they're gone. Did you catch what Jeremy said? Jeremy runs across the room and says to Adam, a guy who has been very, very clear he does not believe in Anything beyond religion. Your God must be real. Does that sound like a first step? Why would he say that? Well, because he saw the power of God at work. And he never would have had that first step. He never would have taken that step towards understanding the reality of God if Adam had not wanted to bless Jeremy. And Jeremy had taken the first step towards Jesus. And, and the story's not complete. The story for Jeremy is just beginning, and it makes you wonder how long until Jeremy goes from saying your God must be real to saying my God is real. Folks, evangelism does not have to be any more complicated than this. Than to pray, to listen, to eat, and to serve. To serve powerfully. We'll build upon that one more time before we're done. But it does not have to be any more complicated than starting there. To pray, to listen, to eat. And to serve. Jesus commanded us to do so. And he demonstrated this radical shift on how his followers can do so by serving others in the world around us. And I believe that every single one of us at West Meadows has the desire to do so. Has the ability to do so. Now some of us are a little more nervous and hesitant than others. I know. But I also hear many, many people who are sharing stories with me of how they are applying this to their daily lives. And they're seeing Results. Man, I got some stories I'm going to share. I'm going to save those for the last week of the series, though. you got to make sure you're back here on the last week. I'm going to share some stories of what things around West Meadows have been happening as these principles are being applied. But that doesn't mean we're done applying them. That means go out there and keep applying them. Let's get even more stories that we can share of the difference that, that the people of West Meadows have made in the community around us. And so we want to be a people who are serving. And we're going to end our service today. By doing an act of service that we have not done for over three years. And you probably noticed that we're going to serve communion today. Now, I don't know if this is going to be a regular thing or just a today thing. But today it's a thing. We're going to serve communion to our brothers and sisters who are here with us. Now, this idea of communion is that, that all of us who have entered into a saving relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, by accepting his work upon the cross as forgiveness for our sins. That all of us who have made that profession of faith, whether you made that today or a day in the past, we gather around this table together to reaffirm our belief, our faith, and our stance with him. And to remember his sacrifice, the cost that made it all possible. And as we do so, we do so within the unity of the brothers and sisters of Christ. And, and, and did you ever think about, as we haven't done this for a couple years, but 
But we actually get to apply those three Ps we talked about earlier as we do it. Because we are currently in proximity to a few hundred people. We are gathered together in proximity. And as we pass the trays and as we take the elements, we do so with those that we are in proximity with. And as we do it, we do it personally. We personally serve. As we hold the tray for the person beside us, we are personally serving the person beside us. And we do it powerfully. It doesn't mean like forcefully. We, we, we do it powerfully. Not because of our power, right? Because we're remembering, we're reaffirming, we're recommitting our lives to the power of Jesus Christ that gave us life through the sacrifice of his. So I invite you to, to take a moment of reflection. I'm going to invite the servers to come forward, and, and I'm going to head down to the table. But as we do that, I just want to invite you to a moment of reflection, to prepare your hearts for this time of service together. At this table, we reflect upon and we celebrate Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life that we can receive, the means of our salvation. And this is a beautiful way that we can remember how Jesus Christ gave his life as a service to all people. You know, as, as I first thought about that phrase, as he gave his life as a service to all people, I, I kind of I, I kind of cringed a little bit. Thinking, is, was it a service to us? It was a service to the Heavenly Father. And, and I started to push it that way. But, but, but then I was reminded that, of what Jesus said. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And before he finished that statement, he said, and to give my life as a ransom for many. That was the act of service. And that was for us. And I think my, maybe you join me in that. My, my, my resistance to that thought is, is kind of in the, in the footsteps of Peter, who was like, you shall never wash my feet. You shall never have to touch my filth. But Jesus Christ said, there is no other way. And he took it all and paid the price for all. That we could be made wiped clean of that. How did he do that? He did it through Proximity. Where out of love for all people, Jesus Christ stepped down from eternity and came near, came near to us. He did it personally as he himself gave his life upon the cross for your sin and for mine. To offer salvation to all who would choose to receive him as personal savior. And he did it powerfully, powerfully, that in this one act of humble service, we can be fully, completely set free. Oh, praise to the glory of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. So as we remember these things, I want to invite us to pray. I invite Michael to join us, lead us in prayer. Oh, actually, we're going to wait. Sorry, I'm a step ahead of myself. See, it's all new for us too. We're going to distribute the elements first and then we're going to pray. So let's do that now as we remember the, the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us as these elements are distributed.
And now before we take the bread together, I'd like to ask Michael to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we eat this bread today in remembrance of the great sacrifice you made for us all on the cross. God, it's so humbling to think about how you know each of us intimately and yet you love us so, so much. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the salvation that your death and resurrection affords us. Thank you that it was a free gift. And thank you for the freedom that we have in you. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. On the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, broke it, and he gave thanks for it. And he gave it to his followers. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We will transition our mind to the cup, the sacrifice of Christ, the blood of the covenant. We'll ask Carrie to pray for that. Father, with this cup, we remember that which Jesus accomplished for us through his blood, shed for each of us. May we, may we be ever thankful. Amen. And in the same way, after taking and eating of his body, Christ also said, this is the new covenant made in my blood. As often as you drink it, remember that sacrifice of myself on the cross. Take and drink. And in this time, we encourage you to continue to reflect, to continue to ponder that new covenant made in the blood of Christ. You can remain seated or feel free to stand with us as we continue to worship through song as well.
by the precious blood then my Jesus will now the curse of sin has no hold on me whom the sun sets free oh is free indeed and now my dad is free it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus will now the curse of sin has no hold on me in the sun. Father, as we've gathered in this place for the purpose of declaring your greatness, your awesomeness, your, your work that made it possible, Lord, for us to, to express to you just our heartfelt, overwhelming gratitude for the gift of Jesus Christ that we've just sung. I, I pray, Lord, that each heart here that was just lifted high, and declaring hallelujah, Praise be to the God above. Well, that we would carry that with us out into this, into this world in which we go. Lord, that as we take it with us, that, that we would be just moved to have opportunities to see and to hear and the courage to step forward to, to serve others in your name, in your love, that they too could come to know the joy of a life with Jesus Christ, the hope of a future with Jesus Christ and the promise of eternity spent with you. God, our world needs that. Our world desperately needs that. As we head these next few days into Thanksgiving weekend, Lord, may we not only be those who are thankful throughout the days ahead, but help other people understand the source of truth, thankfulness that they can experience as well. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice upon the cross, for your work in our lives, how you personally and powerfully move amongst each of us. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you for being with us today. And as always, if there's anything we can do to pray with you, please feel free to come forward following the service. And then next week we're going to do something a bit different. We're going to take a break from the series, and we're going to focus upon Thanksgiving. And so we want to encourage you to come back next Sunday at 10 a.m. for that, and we'll see you all then.